the introduction. Hello, everybody. This is Eric. I will be uh, covering for you today 10 common mistakes in fatigue analysis. This is the first of a series of three webinars that we're going to be putting on, each one of them being about a half hour in duration, where we're going to cover 10 uh, common topics. So for today, uh, we're just going to go ahead and go through this list. And we're going to start off with the first um, common mistake made in fatigue analysis, and it has to do with using the stress life methodology. Stress life methodology is the first methodology that we came to understand in terms of trying to model crack initiation. However, what we know um, from a, a more detailed uh, look into the way in which cracks initiate is that it is something that's driven by changes in strain. Now we know that stress and strain have this nice linear relationship so long as we're within the elastic region, and that is where the stress life approach works really, really well. Uh, this region is something that we would also call the high cycle region. Um, however, there are uh, a number of occasions where we see users using the stress life methodology for the low cycle region. Uh, this would be regions where we start to see plasticity occurring in our hot spots, and uh, the cycle of failure are going to be fairly low. Now, you can imagine uh, for the stress life methodology, uh, we can describe this center portion of our curve with a simple slope and an intercept. And mathematically, there's nothing that prevents us from extrapolating this curve back to the left into the low cycle region. So sure, uh, from a numerical perspective, we could use that. However, it is unlikely that you're going to get a reasonable and accurate damage result uh, by using this particular approach. So if you guys find yourself in a scenario where you have uh, plasticity occurring in hot spots or you see failures occurring uh, in the low cycle counts, uh, the best approach for you to take uh, for crack initiation is going to be to use the strain life methodology. This is an approach that is applicable for both low and high cycle fatigue. The second uh, common mistake is one that uh, is about uh, the definition of a cycle, and uh, it is often misunderstood. So what we know is that um, a, a crack, uh, whether we're going to be initiating a crack or growing a crack, is going to be driven by cyclic loads. These cyclic loads, in turn, are going to create uh, cyclic stresses or strains, depending on uh, how you're looking at it on a structure. Hot spots where we have sharp geometric features uh, are going to appear, and that's usually where we're going to see um, the damage occurring. We also know that constant stress will not cause crack initiation or crack growth. But what's really important here is to be able to quantify a cycle. How big is this cycle? And we can see here on the on the graph, we've got a very simple sine curve. Uh, what we can say is that a cycle can be described as having a peak be followed by a valley and then uh, returning to another peak. And the shape of this particular um, this particular um, curve is, is really not the most important thing. Um, we could have a sine wave here. We could have a sawtooth pattern. Uh, what's really, really important is that we have described those peaks and valleys. And we can describe that in a couple of different ways. Uh, we can describe that with a pair of uh, the stress max or the stress min. We can describe it in terms of stress amplitude and a mean stress. We can also describe it in, in terms of the stress range and a mean stress. So any one of those three pairs is going to give us the information we need uh, to be able to describe what we need to do fatigue calculations on this particular stress cycle. We have quite a bit of confusion uh, that comes from looking at uh, the stress life plots. You may find inconsistencies when looking at plots, uh, particularly if you're looking at some older plots, uh, because they're not all the same. If you look closely on the vertical axis, you'll notice different labels. Uh, in the early days, uh, there were a lot of labels that you would see uh, labeled maximum stress. Uh, the idea here was everybody assumed that we had a mean stress of zero, 
We do, weren't doing any kind of mean stress corrections in this particular case. And that max stress was really something like a stress amplitude. Uh, we got a little bit more sophisticated, gained more knowledge about fatigue, uh, became more advanced, and then began to describe it in terms of stress amplitude. And that can also be described in terms of stress range. The stress range, if the mean stress is zero, is simply going to be twice the amplitude. Now, if you overlook any of these differences and you're doing some type of, uh, let's say, a simple hand calculation, uh, what you're going to end up seeing are some significantly uh, drastic errors in your damage. So do keep in mind uh, the labels on the axes. Uh, they, they do vary uh, depending upon the literature you're looking in. Uh, or depending on how uh, the material is characterized. Uh, the, the good thing to keep in mind, though, is that all of these inconsistencies that we have uh, with units, they're going to be managed with the software. So if you are within ENCODE and you're doing fatigue analysis, uh, it's going to be managing that for you. The fourth mistake uh, that we have on our list today has to do with ignoring mean stresses pre stresses or assembly stresses. So uh, imagine having um, a cycle of stress. Uh, a lot of times when we see a very simple curve like we saw a few slides ago, the mean stress is assumed to be zero. And the primary driver of that is going to be the size of the cycle. So size is the most important thing. However, mean stress is going to have a secondary effect on fatigue. What we can say in general terms is that tensile mean stresses will be detrimental to fatigue, and compressive mean stresses can be beneficial to fatigue. If we look over on the right, we've got two examples of uh, damage plot shown on the same structure. And the very first one, the upper one, shows us damage results where we took mean stresses into consideration. Uh, the load that we have applied uh, in this case is an an asymmetric load, so you can kind of imagine this structure is constrained on the right end, and on the left end we're applying a bending load, bending in the vertical plane. And this particular load cycle that we've created is going to press downward 10 newtons and then press upward 5 newtons. So that's going to be our cycle. And you can imagine with a cycle like this that's biased a little bit more uh, downward than upward, we would tend to see higher tensile stresses on this top surface, and if we could see it, we would expect to see higher compressive stresses on the lower surface. Since tensile stresses are detrimental to fatigue, uh, we would expect to see a brighter hot spot right here than on the bottom, and that is exactly what happened. Now, if we intentionally go into the software, we turn off our mean stress corrections, and we rerun our analysis, what we're going to see is a much smaller hotspot right here with much, much lower uh, magnitudes of damage. And you can see that just by comparing uh, the max value that was seen in this analysis compared to the max value up here. So it's very important to take into consideration mean stresses. They can come about, um, in this case, simply by having um, a load cycle that's slightly biased off of, uh, off of a, a mean load of of let's say zero newtons. There are other occasions also that would create uh, a scenario where we might have a non-zero mean stress. Uh, a really common example is where we have a static condition uh, that is in tandem with a cyclic condition. Uh, a really common one would be something like a bolt tightening. So imagine having a structure where we tighten a bolt. That bolt then introduces stresses into the structure. Those stresses are static. They're not going to be cyclic. We then put that part out into service, or we do a simulation where we're, we're simulating a maneuver. And the cyclic stresses would then be superimposed on top of the static stress. And that static stress oftentimes is going to introduce some type of a non-zero mean stress. Same thing is going to be true for assembly stresses. So the recommendation here is to always take into consideration the mean stresses. And there are several common mean stress correction methods. If you're using a stress life approach, uh, you've probably heard of them. Uh, you would use Goodman or Gerber. And if you're doing a strain life mean stress correction, uh, two very common methods are going to be the Morrow or the Smith-Watson property. 
The fifth common mistake is one where we assume simplified load. Now, it's completely understandable that uh, you may be in a situation where all you have is simplified load that is meant to represent some real life event. The simplified load uh, could be in the form of a, a constant amplitude cycle. That's kind of like what we see in the upper plot here. It may be a bit more sophisticated where we have some block uh, cycle loads. Uh, this would essentially be a small count of, uh, of different stress cycles or load cycles. Uh, we'd have a group of large cycles followed by a group of medium-sized cycles, and then finally followed up by maybe a group of small cycles. Just to kind of come up with a mix, uh, again, an attempt to better approximate some real-life measurements. However, the software has the ability of utilizing real measured load data. And as we all know, this is going to yield far more accurate results. And this is going to be especially true when we have interactions of multiple load histories. So if you can imagine having um, instrumented a vehicle or a uh, structure and you're measuring multiple loads, maybe we're measuring something like X, Y, and Z loads on the corner of a vehicle, we can take those three loads we can combine them with three load cases. And since all of this is in a time domain, we can then get the correct stress state at every point in the stress history. Uh, this is something that would be really hard for us to do when uh, we've simplified it for block loading. Uh, we would certainly have to have started with uh, the original data anyway. Uh, so you might as well go ahead and, and make use of the real measured data and not assume simplified loads. The number six uh, mistake is confusing, confusing correction factors. Um, there are quite a few different correction factors. Um, we see uh, quite often uh, some correction factors being blended together or, or kind of uh, baked in together with one another. Uh, but there are quite a few of them. They each serve a unique purpose. And what we can say uh, in general is that uh, if you think back to the way in which a material is characterized, uh, we typically have a test specimen. It is precisely prepared. It has a very smooth surface finish. It has fairly simple geometry. It is essentially a structure that is designed to fail in the middle section. We can see the sample picture on the left. And the idea is, let's create a specimen that is um, void of any uh, kind of contributing factors. Uh, like a surface treatment or surface finish or corrosion or sharp geometric features and try and just characterize the way in which the material will respond to cyclic load. That's going to get us either our stress or our strain life methodology. Our structures that we design daily, though, are going to have quite a few uh, different surface finishes and surface treatments and geometries. So, the test specimen does not necessarily equal of the structures we're designing. You can see a structure on the right. It looks like a cast structure. Uh, so certainly some surfaces have a rough cast finish. Uh, you can also see some surfaces that have a machine finish. That surface finish alone is going to contribute differently to how uh, stress cycles will cause fatigue. We've got sharp geometric features. We've got uh, embossed serial numbers. And who knows, there might even be a surface treatment on the structure. So these are all things that we're going to need to take into consideration. We're going to need to apply these correction factors as we're doing our fatigue calculations, whether it's on a, on a physical test part or an FE model. And the one thing that we need to be sure of as well is not to assume that stresses from our FE model or from uh, strain gauge measurements correspond with the hot spot. You know, it's it's difficult to place a strain gauge um, where we really need it in most cases. Uh, that, that hot spot is, is often caused by some geometric discontinuity, and we can't place a strain gauge there. So the common practice is let's go ahead and place it uh, close to the hot spot, some distance away. And as soon as you do that, uh, we are no longer measuring the strain in the hot spot. We're measuring the strain of, uh, a distance away. We need to correct for that. That's going to be done with uh, correction factor law like KF. 
so taking into consideration uh, all these different pressure factors, whether they be KT, KF, or some type of a surface correction. Number seven, and this is perhaps one of my favorite ones, has to do with very small, what we might think of as inconsequential uh, bits of uh, geometry. Uh, it's surprising how often this occurs. Uh, these inconsequential serial numbers can, in fact, contribute to fatigue. So depending upon your structure, it may be a cast structure where uh, you have an embossed serial number. In other cases, they may have been engraved, maybe with uh, um, an engraver or etched or maybe a vibrating pen, or perhaps even stamped uh, where they've been struck with a hammer. All of these uh, have the uh, ability to contribute to fatigue, especially if they're in an area of high stress. Uh, so we need to really, really pay close attention to these small features. Uh, you know, you can kind of think of uh, these methods. Um, some of them are more manual, uh, like the stamping ones. There's going to be quite a bit of variation in terms of how they would contribute to fatigue. Um, we joke sometimes that uh, certain numbers or letters are going to be worse than others. Uh, you can kind of imagine um, the letter I or the letter uh, L or maybe a number one would be a bit more severe than uh, a zero simply because they have, on a very small scale, a much sharper uh, geometric discontinuity. You can see on the right we've got uh, a zoomed in uh, picture of a casting. There's been a fatigue failure on this one and that fatigue failure is occurring right at the serial numbers here. On the left we've got another sample image. Uh, two, um, two piston arms. We've got uh, serial numbers stamped in here. Uh, there are some letters as well. Uh, the one on the left is the one that failed. I'm not entirely sure if there were serial numbers here, but you can see that this failure location is, in fact, in the same location where we've stamped some serial numbers. So we really need to pay attention to these small features, uh, keep them away from high stress regions, and you know, one of the bigger challenges also is that we're not going to be modeling uh, serial numbers in our FE model, uh, so that geometry isn't even represented. And the design engineer might not even be responsible for the location of these embossed or stamped serial numbers. Uh, a lot of times that's handled in manufacturing, and uh, they're not necessarily the person who had done all of the fatigue analysis and taken a lot of these things into consideration. So definitely something worth uh, worth taking into consideration. Number eight. Uh, this is another very common one that we get. Uh, oftentimes we have uh, customers calling and asking us if uh, if our software can solve their their failure. And there's going to be, uh, in some cases, uh, some misunderstanding about what the actual failure criteria is, or, or perhaps it's not not clearly defined. So, depending on what our structure is, um, the end use is, is often going to be what drives the criteria. Uh, that criteria could be um, yielding. Uh, perhaps we don't want our structures to yield. Uh, perhaps it's more of a, a wear issue. Maybe it's a drivetrain issue with uh, seen a, a lot of wear on uh, on the teeth. Uh, the failure mode might be creep. If it's something that is in a hot environment, the failure mode might be fatigue. And if it is fatigue, uh, we can break that down even further uh, because there's two stages of fatigue. We've got cracking issues from the crack growth. So then the question becomes, what is your definition of a fatigue failure? And we use this term uh, in very generic in a very generic sense. Uh, but it becomes very important, uh, at least the definition of it. Depending on who you are, uh, the industry that you're in, the type of components that you're designing, your failure criteria might simply be crack initiation. Uh, your goal would be, let's design a structure that can withstand some, some estimated uh, life or maybe multiple life and make this structure such that cracks will not initiate during that life path. Other people, other industries, are going to be more damage tolerant. This is something that's seen a bit more in aerospace. For aerospace design, there are certain situations where we're going to allow a crack to grow. Um, we're going to be monitoring that. Uh, we're going to implement uh, in-service inspections 
uh, as well as replacing those parts when a package to uh, some certain length. Uh, hopefully, that's going to be long before a critical crack length. So in those cases, they will need to do a crack initiation analysis, which is going to be either a stress life or strain life methodology. And then they're going to follow that up with crack growth. So important take here is let's clearly define the failure criteria. And once you've done that, come up with the methodologies that you need to be able to define those failures. All right, number nine. This one has to do with welds. And one of the biggest uh, mistakes that we see here is not correctly defining the material properties for a weld. So what we do know is that welds are a common site uh, for failures, uh, failures of many kinds, including fatigue. Uh, there are a lot of reasons for this. Uh, the welds themselves, they introduce a heat affected zone. Um, they tend to reduce the material properties. They introduce residual stresses. These, by the way, are, are very hard to quantify. A lot of times the welds are, are performed with a manual procedure, so the quality of the weld itself would be an issue. Uh, the Screen captures that you see here are, are perhaps some of uh, the worst welds that, that you might see, but uh, we, we hope that in a, in a modern manufacturing environment, we have a really good control of the quality of the weld. And even though we may have good quality on the weld, there's still, on a smaller scale, it's going to be inconsistencies in the geometry. Uh, you're going to have sharp edges uh, along the weld line. And all of these are going to contribute to the durability of a weld. So we have a couple of ways we can address this. Um, since there are so many things affecting the weld, uh, instead of trying to characterize just weld material and then applying correction factors after the fact, uh, what we will do is actually characterize um, a test specimen that is an entire weldment itself. Uh, imagine a couple of square tubes being welded together in a, a predefined configuration we would load those to failure under a cyclic loading. We would characterize quite a few of those. All of those are going to be of the same configuration. And what that allows us to do in the material definition is to essentially characterize and capture all of these contributing effects, like uh, the heat affected zone and, and uh, the residual stresses. So once we've done that, we then need to take that material uh, definition and apply it to the weld area. So I guess the next uh, part of this, the, the common mistake, is that customers will assign the parent material property to the entire model, including the weld. When this is done, uh, you are likely going to miss quite a few hot spots in the weld area. And the inverse of this would be assigning the weld material to the entire model. And what that will probably do is give you some false positives in areas on the parent material that really aren't going to have any kind of damage on them, uh, but just because of uh, the poor quality that we've assigned to the whole model, we start to see higher damage. So the best approach would be, let's go ahead and assign unique material properties to the weld area, and then uh, also to the parent material corresponding with, with the mechanical properties that they have. All right, we are getting to the end of it. This is the last one, number 10. And this one has to do with how we combine stress states. Um, depending upon what we're trying to design for, there are some materials where, let's say, we're just looking for a static failure. Um, we might simply uh, do a stress analysis and look at the von, um, the von Mises stresses. And that might be a perfectly acceptable uh, stress state to use for whatever failure criteria we've chosen. The problem with the von uh, the, the von Mises stress is that it is a scalar of positive value, and it doesn't describe the full stress cycle that we would see in a cyclic environment. So imagine, for example, the cylinder that we have in the upper left, and we apply a cyclical axial load on that structure. You can then, in the next region, pick a critical point, and as you apply a tensile load, you begin to pull on that cylinder, that point right there is going to extend axially, and it's also going to contract radially. And that's going to produce a stress state. Now, for fatigue, we're really interested in 
the stresses on the surface. So we can kind of simplify this to a 2D stress state just on the surface, and that would show us a contraction and also an extension, aligning the extension with uh, the axial direction. And there will be stresses that are a result of that, uh, that deflection. When we take a closer look, we can see that um, depending on how we load this, depending on how complex our geometry is, we might have multiple loads. That stress cycle may be moving around on us a bit. It may be changing directions. It may be non-proportional. So there are other stress combination methods we, need to, uh, we might need to use. Uh, for this simple case right here, we could probably get away with a sign of automatically stress. That would uh, basically be one step up from a, a conventional von Mises stress where we actually display both a positive and negative stress, so the compressive and tensile. That would give us uh, a full stress cycle here. We could look at the principal stresses as well, although there is a potential that you might miss a portion of the cycle if we look at just the minimum principal or the maximum principal stress. And then the one that we typically fall on, this is the default one, would be the as-max principle. And a terminology that really suggests that we're just looking at both the max and the min principle, and whichever one has the absolute magnitude, let's go ahead and use that. That's going to describe for us um, our full cycle, and it works very well for uniaxial stresses. Now, not all of our stresses are uniaxial. Uh, sometimes they begin to uh, exhibit multiaxial stress states. And in those cases, we need to fall on a more comprehensive uh, and also uh, computationally intensive method. It's not written on the slide here, but it's one called critical plane. And essentially what we do is we start with looking at um, on our little uh, spot at the neck in our cylinder, uh, we look at stresses that are aligned uh, with uh, a global x-axis. Then we also look at uh, the sigma y and a shear for that particular uh, 2D stress state. We look at, uh, we, we align the plane along the x-axis. We look at the stress histories we get from that. And then we, we rotate that plane about a vector that is normal to the, the point on, on our structure. We rotate it about 10 degrees, or actually exactly 10 degrees. So now what we're going to do is we're going to see a little bit less of the sigma x, a little bit more of the sigma y. We come up with another stress history, and we're going to repeat that process every 10 degrees until we've swept the full 180 degrees. It's going to give us 18 stress histories, which is one location on our, on our structure. And each one of those stress histories will do damage calculations on that, and one of them will return a higher amount of damage than the others. That then is going to be the more damaging direction, um, and the result that is typically going to be outputted from doing a, a calculation uh, let's say on an FE model. So that wraps it up, guys. That was our brief 30-minute uh, webinar on 10 common mistakes in fatigue analysis. Uh, hopefully, uh, you guys uh, found this interesting and 